Thank you, Sherry. Good morning, Utica. What a great day. What a great day of worship it has already been. And uh, I know that will continue over the next few minutes. Uh, for those of you who don't do Facebook, uh, I want to share with you a confession that I gave on Facebook, I think on Friday, as I was putting uh, some of these slides together for the last time. Uh, I admitted that I was not really looking forward to this message. Uh, if you've been following along with us, uh, you know that we have now been in the book of Proverbs. I think this is our 10th or 11th week, and we are finishing the introduction. How about that? How about a 10-week introduction? Uh, and I, I, I got to be honest with you, I was not looking forward to it because I know how the book of Proverbs is structured. I know that these first nine chapters are really the introductory part of the rest of the book, and it's the part in which Solomon primarily is trying to get our attention. And he's trying to get us to understand there is a way that seems right unto a man and a woman but in the end, it is the way of death. But I'm offering you a better way. I'm offering to you a different way. I'm offering you a way that leads to life. And really, beginning in Proverbs chapter 10, we're going to start a new series, still in the book of Proverbs, but starting next week, we start a new series called Proverbial Wisdom, because the rest of the book is not laid out kind of verse by verse, where we can kind of just go through it like we have been so far. But it is different topics. It's different things that we're going to come across as we walk through this journey that's called life. So we're going to be looking at the proverbial wisdom on topics like family and friends and wealth and emotions and that kind of stuff. So we begin that next week. But this week we conclude this, this long nine-chapter introduction to the book. And I'm thinking, Lord, do we really need another part of the introduction? I remember at a previous church, I invited a guest speaker from, uh, from the state convention, and he came, and he was going to preach at the church. And I knew he was going to do a great job. I'd heard him preach before. And I knew that our people were going to love his message, and I knew what he was going to preach about. And then he started talking, and he kept talking, and he kept talking, and I thought, well, maybe he's decided to change what he was going to preach about because he's not talking about that stuff yet. And we got about 20 minutes into the message, and then he prayed. And I thought, well, that's an interesting message. He didn't really ever get to that. But that was the opening prayer. And then he started reading the Scripture, and then he got to the message. And I'm thinking, oh, my goodness, that is the longest introduction I've ever heard in my life. And I didn't want to do that. So honestly, when I turned to Proverbs 9 this week, I said, Lord, I want you to show me the verses that we're really going to spend time on this morning. I want you to help me see what it is in this chapter that's really significantly different from what we've already seen. And I read through it quickly, and I thought, okay, I'll read through it again. Because surely if I read through it again, I'm going to find something new in this chapter. Well, guess what? The Lord is faithful. He is, he is good, not because there's anything new in this chapter, because I think that today he is helping us, as, he, as we conclude this introduction, he is helping us to see there is a stark contrast that lays before us. We have a choice. Are we going to follow Lady Wisdom, or are we going to be seduced by Madam Folly? And it is not a choice that we just make at one point in our life. If you have walked down the aisle of this church or some other church and you've surrendered your life to Jesus and you think that you have made that choice once and for all, you have deceived yourself. Because we are never more athletic than when we jump from one path to the other. I mean, we can be going along on the right path, following lady wisdom and doing well, and then something comes up, and then we just leap over here, because this is where we want to be in this moment. It is a choice that we have to make every day, and not even just once a day. Every circumstance that we are, in, that, that we are presented with, every conversation that we have with another sinner, 
that lives among us. Because any conversation you have involves at least two sinners. And those don't often go well because we have a choice. I want us to read about that choice in Proverbs chapter 9. See, I'm done with the introduction. Proverbs chapter 9. Find your place in God's Word. Stand with me to honor the reading of His Word because it is His Word that leads us to life. Before we begin reading, just notice the way the chapter is built. The first six or seven verses, the first six verses is the voice of Lady Wisdom. Verses 13 through 18 is the voice of Madam Folly. And verses 7 through 12 help us to understand the consequences of that choice. Wisdom has built her house. She has hewn her seven pillars. She has slaughtered her beasts. She has mixed her wine. She has also set her table. She has sent out her young women to call from the highest places in the town. Whoever is simple, let him turn in here. To him who lacks sense, she says, come, eat of my bread and drink of the wine I have mixed. Leave your simple ways and live and walk in the way of insight. Whoever corrects a scoffer gets himself abuse. And he who reproves a wicked man incurs injury. Do not reprove a scoffer or he will hate you. Reprove a wise man and he will love you. Give instruction to a wise man and he will be still wiser. Teach a righteous man and he will increase in learning. The fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom. And the knowledge of the Holy One is insight. For by me, your days will be multiplied and years will be added to your life. If you are wise, you are wise for yourself. If you scoff, you alone will bear it. The woman folly is loud. She is seductive and knows nothing. She sits at the door of her house she takes a seat on the highest places of the town, calling to those who pass by, who are going straight on their way. Whoever is simple, let him turn in here. And to him who lacks sense, she says, stolen water is sweet and bread eaten in secret is pleasant. But he does not know that the dead are there that her guests are in the depths of Sheol. This is God's word. Let's pray to him as he speaks to us now. Heavenly Father, we thank you for the truth of your word. We thank you for this clear choice that we see this morning. Father, we wish it was as easy to make the right choice as it is to see that we have two different choices. And so, Father, I pray as I did earlier that you would open our hearts and our minds, that we might be willing learners this morning, that we might not think that we have it all figured out, that, might, that we might be aware that even as we travel down the road of life, that there are detours that entice us all along the way. Thank you for loving us enough to reach out to us. And we pray that you would continue to do that in these moments. And we ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. So what we see in this chapter is that we have two different competitors that are always competing for our attention. They're always competing for our affection. They're always competing that we might choose their way. Lady Wisdom and Madam Folly. We've been introduced to Lady Wisdom already. Let's jump to verse 3 as we hear a little bit more about what she has to offer. She has sent out her young woman, your, her young women, to call from the highest places in the town. She, she has done the work to make the feast readily available, and now she sends out the invitation. The house has been built, the meal has been prepared, the table has been set, and now the guests are invited. Verse 4, whoever is simple, let him turn in here. 
To him who lacks sense, she says, come, eat of my bread and drink of the wine I have mixed. She invites all of us that need to learn from her. It probably should remind us of a a parable that we read in the Gospels. Jesus tells a very similar parable, at least it begins in a similar way. Matthew chapter 22, verses 2 and 3, Jesus says, The kingdom of heaven may be compared to a king who gave a wedding feast and sent his servants to call those who were invited to the wedding feast. We have spent nine, ten weeks already hearing the invitation of Lady Wisdom. Beginning next week, we'll begin to hear that in some very specific areas of our life. As we look at the way we deal with our family, Lady Wisdom is saying, come over, I've got some good advice for you. I know the way to make this thrive. I know the way to help you be a good steward with the money that God has given you instead of being stingy and selfish because that won't go well. But Lady Wisdom is calling out to us. But her voice is not the only voice that we hear. We also hear the voice of Madame Folly. Listen in in verses 13 through 16. The woman folly is loud. She is seductive. She knows nothing. She sits at the door of her house. She takes a seat on the highest places of the town, calling to those who pass by, who are going straight on their way. Whoever is simple, let him turn in here. I hope you noticed those are the exact same words as the invitation of Lady Wisdom. Look at verse 4 and compare it to verse 16. Lady Wisdom calls out to us. Madam Folly calls out to us. And the words are exactly the same. Madam Folly doesn't wear a name tag. She doesn't come up to us with a name tag that says, Hello, my name is Madam Folly. And if you follow me, it will not go well for you. No, she is seductive. She tries to blend in. She tries to appear as if she's offering us the way of life. It says in verse 14, she sits at the door of her house. I think one comparison, one contrast that we do see in this passage is that Lady Wisdom goes out of her way to pursue us. She chases us down. She goes out in the streets. We saw last week that she was in the crossroads of the city because she desperately wants to offer what we desperately need. That there is no better demonstration of the pursuit of Lady Wisdom than the incarnation of the Son of God. He loved us enough to leave the throne of heaven and come to this earth in pursuit of us. But Madam Folly, she just sits at the doorway of her house. She is just waiting for an opportunity to take advantage of those who pass by. And it got me to thinking, where is the door of her house? She's got a big house. We, we, We come up to the doorway of her house all the time. She has a doorway on Facebook where she entices us to get into silly arguments and to broadcast to the world the fact that we are not sanctified yet. She has a doorway on Facebook. She has a doorway on Twitter. She has a doorway on Instagram. I think she has a doorway on Snapchat, but I went to look for it and it disappeared. So I'm not sure about that one. (laughs) She has a doorway. Did I do that one right? All right, good. (laughs) She has a doorway at your workplace as people invite you to complain about the way things are to complain about your boss or how hard the work is or how low the pay is. She has a doorway there. She has a doorway in your living room, in your dining room, in your bedroom. Her her doorways are all over the place. 
Because like I said, we can be going along just fine on the path of wisdom, and all of a sudden we make one wrong decision and we find ourselves way over here because she's pulled us in. There's Lady Wisdom and there is Madam Folly, and we have a choice to make. Which one is going to have the affection of our heart? Which one are we going to be looking for? See, that's the secret. It's not just what choice do we make. Which one are we going to be looking for? Knowing they're both out there, do we want to follow Lady Wisdom, who we've said all along is, is not just a book. It, she's not just the book of Proverbs. She's not just our moral conscience. Lady Wisdom is ultimately personified in the person of Jesus Christ. He wants to have a relationship with us. The Holy Spirit wants to guide us and to steer us, but He will not control us. I wish He would. I wish He would just override my stupidity and just steer me where I need to go, but that's not the way it works. We have to look for it. We have to want it. The choice is there. And Jonathan Aiken says, how we act reveals which invitation we have accepted. You know, you can say all along that you believe in Jesus. You can say that you've surrendered your life to Jesus. You can say that you believe the Bible. You can say that you want to live the way the Bible tells us to live. But when it all comes down to it, the way you live demonstrates what you believe. We can say whatever we want to say, but when it comes down to doing something, we do what we believe. And so I think there are some checkpoints here in the middle of this passage. We're just going to look at a couple of them. And I, let me tell you, they're hard. Not, not hard as in hard to understand, but they're hard to swallow. Because I don't know about you, but as I use these checkpoints in my life, I often find that I'm on the wrong road. I don't pass the test. Let's look at a few of these checkpoints. The, the first one, are you a know-it-all in response to instruction? Are you a know-it-all? In response to instruction. When someone loves you enough to try to teach you a better way, is your first response, is the first attitude of your heart to look down at that person and say, what are you going to teach me? I've already got that figured out. That is a checkpoint. That, that helps us to know if we're traveling on the right road because the ones who are following Lady Wisdom, the ones who have a relationship with Jesus, want to learn. And so when they have the opportunity to receive instruction, they don't respond like know-it-alls. And as I look around the sanctuary, I know we have a lot of different kinds of people in here, a lot of different ages of people, a lot of different circumstances. We, we sang about the God of every generation, and God knows where it is in your life where you are most likely to act like a know-it-all. It might be in your relationship with your parents. As they're trying to teach you something, you act like you don't need to learn it. It might be that you act that way at work when your boss is trying to teach you something. It might be that in your, in, your, in your friendships, we're going to look at those in a couple of weeks, but it might be that God has been gracious to give you Christian friends who speak wisdom into your life, but you kind of spit on them because you act like a know-it-all. That shows that you're on the wrong road, at least in that moment. That's the thing. It's not permanent. For most of us, it's not permanent, especially for those of us who have trusted in Jesus. We're not permanently on the right road. Just because you've surrendered your life to Jesus doesn't mean you stay on that right road. This is a checkpoint. Are you a know-it-all 
in response to instruction? Or are you an eager learner? Do you respond to instruction by saying, thank you, Lord? So really, that that question goes together. This is compare and contrast. Are you a know-it-all or an eager learner in response to instruction in your life? If you ask, where are you getting that question? Verse 9 gives us just a little bit of of an answer to that. Give instruction to a wise man, and he will be still wiser. Teach a righteous man, and he will increase in learning. Is that your response when God is gracious enough to send somebody into your path to teach you something that you don't know? Are you an eager learner? Now, that checkpoint's not quite as painful as this next one. They're very related, but this one's more painful. This one hurts more. Are you an arrogant jerk in response to correction? You see, instruction is one thing. Teach me something. Correction, that's a whole different ballgame, right? Because correction means you're not doing this right. Not just, I want to teach you something new. Correction means that somebody is in your life, whether it's just the leadership of the Holy Spirit, the truth of God's Word, the godly counsel of a friend, the loving correction of a parent. Correction says, I love you enough to tell you you're not doing this right. You're not doing well in this area. And let's Let's all admit, we all laughed, and kind of when we were laughing, we were kind of doing this. We were kind of trying to keep this away from us, because we all know we do this naturally. We all know that naturally, when we have correction coming at us, we are arrogant jerks. Now, some of us do a better job of masking that and keeping it on the inside, but let's be honest, that is the natural response of our heart. Look at the text. Look at verse 7 and 8. Whoever corrects a scoffer gets himself abuse. And he who reproves a wicked man incurs injury. That word reproof means correcting what is wrong. That is a rebuke. That means you're not doing that right. And the word says, the one who reproves a wicked man, and a wicked man can be anybody surrendered to Jesus or not, anybody who is currently walking on the road with Madam Folly. We all can be that wicked man. And the Bible says one of the ways to know if you're on that road is if you're an arrogant jerk when somebody has to correct you. Do not reprove a scoffer or he will hate you. If my kids weren't in the room, I would share with you some stories of when we heard, I hate you. I hate when you do that. And you know what that is? That's just our sinful, selfish spirit saying, I don't want to be corrected. I want to be in charge. I want to do what I want to do. And it's not just teenagers. And it's not just 10-year-olds. It's all of us. We don't like to be corrected, which is why one of the greatest characteristics, one of the most repeated characteristics in all of Scripture when it comes to following Jesus is the word humility. Are we humble when someone wants to correct us, or are we arrogant jerks? I'm coaching baseball this year, coaching Samuel's team in baseball, so 12 and under fall baseball team, and I'm the head coach, but I have been blessed with two coaches that know so much more about that level of baseball than I do. I mean, just like, it's not even a comparison. I thought I knew a lot about baseball until I got to know them. One of them is Cliff Roberts, uh, Cindy's son-in-law. These, these guys are amazing. They've been working with their sons, and they know baseball. And one of our first practices, we're doing a drill And we've got different levels of kids out there. We've got some travel ball kids who are really good. 
We have some other kids that don't play so much. We had one kid that I don't think has ever played baseball, and they're doing this drill, and I'm like, I'm thinking this guy's going to get killed. I'm thinking he's going to die out here because he's not going to be able to catch this ball. And so I stopped everybody, and I said, listen, we got different levels of players out here, and some of you guys are throwing it really hard, and it's going everywhere, and we just need to kind of back off a little bit. And I saw Cliff and the other coach just kind of, they just kind of gave me this little number right here. But they didn't say anything, and so then we did the drill again. And it got so much worse. I mean, like, balls were going everywhere. They were in the dirt, and I blew the whistle, and I was like, what is going on? This is terrible. And the other coach, not in front of the team, because he was humble, but to me personally, he said, that, I could have told you that wasn't going to go well. You, you did not give them good instruction. You don't tell these kids to back off. You don't tell them to do it halfway. It's always going to get worse that way. You see, and that put me at a crossroads. I was right there in that moment where what I wanted to do was say, who's the head coach? <laughs> who's coaching this team? Come on. I'm in charge, and we're going to do it the way I want to do it. But fortunately, in that moment, I made the right choice. And partly because they made the right choice, because they didn't call me out in front of the team. They weren't seeking to embarrass me. They weren't seeking to demonstrate that they were superior. They were trying to help. I mean, that's why you coach recreation department sports, right? Not because you want to demonstrate authority, but because you want to invest in children's lives. And they wanted to do that. In that moment, I made the right choice. I was not an arrogant jerk in that moment. I wish I could say that I live in that moment at home. I wish I could say that when Andrea points out something that where she says, listen, we, we could do a better job. You could do a better job in leading our family in this area. I wish I could always say I get it right. But sometimes I'm an arrogant jerk. Sometimes I'm an arrogant jerk with a hand over my mouth, and I don't say anything. But I know on the inside I'm an arrogant jerk. And God sees that. So are we arrogant jerks in response to correction, or are we humble recipients? When someone loves you enough to correct you, do you receive it humbly? Look at the end of verse 8. We, we, we heard about the scoffer. Do not reprove a scoffer or he will hate you, but reprove a wise man and he will love you. He will recognize that you have his best interests at heart. Is that the way that we respond to correction? Now, we'll get into this a little bit later as we get into proverbial wisdom, but look at Proverbs 12.1. I love this verse. I couldn't make this up. Whoever loves reproof, and let's be honest, not, well, that does not come naturally. None of us like to be corrected. That's why we know it's a supernatural thing. That's why we know we're, we're following the leadership of the Holy Spirit and keeping in step with the Holy Spirit because that is not the desire of our flesh. Whoever loves reproof loves knowledge, but he who hates reproof is stupid. It is stupid, or as my dad would say, stupid. <laughs> it is stupid to hate reproof. Because whoever it is that's giving it to you is doing it because they love you. How do we respond to that? Here's a tough question for you. Jonathan Aiken asked this. Do you have any relationships in which somebody has permission to ask you hard questions? I'll expand that. Do you have any relationships in which somebody has the license to correct you, and you're not going to jump on them. You're not going to respond like an arrogant jerk because you have given them that. That's part of what our authentic man of God study is all about. It's about meeting with other men on Thursday mornings, giving them permission that when that video goes off and it's time to talk about that stuff that we've learned, 
there are some hard questions. That's the reason that I meet with accountability partners, three other pastors here in town on a weekly basis, because I give them permission to ask tough questions and to correct me when I'm wrong. We need to know that choice is before us, and the consequences, I hope, are evident. The consequences are either life or death. Listen to, the, listen to the invitation to life. Verse 6, leave your simple ways and live. Walk in the way of insight. That's Lady Wisdom telling us, follow me and find life. Verse 11, for by me your days will be multiplied and years will be added to your life. The kind of life that Jesus offers to us and that only Jesus can offer to us. Somebody else can peddle a counterfeit but it's counterfeit and it will not last. The life that Jesus offers to us is long-lasting. Usually that means that our life will last long here on earth if we do the things that God tells us to do, but we know that's, that's a general proverb. It's not a specific promise individually, but we do know that if you surrender your life to Jesus, your life will be long-lasting because it will be everlasting. It will be eternal. That even... If you die here on earth, you don't really die. You you enter into life everlasting. It is long-lasting. It is fulfilling. Listen to this. Sin is fun for a moment. But walking with Jesus is fulfilling. It doesn't leave you with that empty feeling in your life as soon as the, the spectacle of the moment is over. The kind of life that Jesus offers to us is fulfilling, and it leads us to a life of faithfulness. So the, one of the consequences, if we go down the right path, it, we find life. But if we go down the wrong path, we find death. Listen to verse 13. The woman, uh, go to the bottom there. Uh, he does not know the dead are there. That's, that's where we are headed if we follow Madam Folly. But here's the dangerous part. We don't always know that. Because Lady Madam Folly is seductive. She, she dresses up as other things. She presents herself well. But she is seductive. That's why it says... Notice notice what she says in verse 17. Stolen water is sweet, and bread eaten in secret is pleasant. She is offering us these things that should be off limits to us, but she's making them look attractive. Knowing full well what we don't always know. Verse 18, he does not know that the dead are there. So Madam Folly is seductive, and she is surprising because she will not tell us the truth. In fact, here's how she works. She tells us just enough half-truth to where we fall for it. And she's been doing it ever since the garden. Just enough half-truth to get us to bite She knows full well that the way ends to death. But we don't know that. I love what Warren Wearsby says about this choice that we have. If you choose to go the way of Madame Folly, you may think that you're going to a feast. But you'll find out that you're going to a funeral. It's your own funeral. And maybe there are enough people around you that love you enough to help you see that while there's still time. But maybe you'll find that out too late. It doesn't have to be too late. The choice is in front of you right now. Verse 10, the fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom. Knowledge of the Holy One is is insight. Look at verse 12. If you are wise, you are wise for yourself. There are benefits in living a life of wisdom. 
But if you scoff, if you follow Madam Folly, if you're an arrogant jerk when someone tries to correct you, if you're a know-it-all when someone tries to instruct you, if you scoff, you alone will bear it. And you will not be able to bear it. And the good news of the gospel is that you don't have to bear it because Jesus bore it for you. That's what 1 Peter 2.24 says. He himself, Jesus, bore our sins in his body on the tree that we might die to sin and live to righteousness. Jesus is right there in front of us saying, I want to help you make the right choice. Listen, some of you are generally on this road. You, generally in life, you're, you're, you're walking with Lady Wisdom. You've surrendered your life to Jesus. And it might be that in many areas of your life, you're doing really good. But there might be this one area over here that you're just being obstinate about and stubborn about. And you just continually give in to your own flesh because it seems like it pays off. But Lady Wisdom is calling. She's saying, walk with me even in that area of your life. But as I look around this sanctuary, in, in a sanctuary this size, I know there are, there are some of you that may think that you're over here. I mean, after all, you're in church. You read your Bible. You pray. You believe in God. You might think that you're over here when all, all along, really, you're walking with Madam Folly. But Jesus is saying this morning, you don't have to stay here. Because I paid the price to get you over there. And I'm calling out to you now, if you will just trust me. If you'll trust me in those moments where you, you really can't figure it all out and you don't know why I would be calling you to walk on that road in that way, in that area of your life, if you would just trust me. And here's the good news that Jesus offers to us in this moment. He is saying to us that the way of death won't be the kiss of death if we will receive the gift of life from the giver of life. He wants to pull us off of that path so that we might have the kind of fulfilling, abundant, joy-filled life that only He can give us. But the choice is ours. Let's pray together.